rest your such a vital prayer that we all must pray we want to know god more thank you for that song let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we begin our message our father we want to know you more you are the great god the creator of heaven and earth who sent his son to die for us you've shown your love for us again and again and again and so lord that love attracts us we want to know you may that be our goal in life and and as i preach this message lord i pray that i would lift you up not me speak through me lord let your spirit be on my lips i pray this in jesus name amen, amen. i think we all have a hobby that we would like to do if we had more time more money a hobby or an interest something that we would like to do if only we had the time to do it maybe for some of us it's gardening or learning a language learning a musical instrument i think if we all thought about it we all have those things in the back of our mind that we we've told ourselves yeah i'd really like to do that but who has the time or who has the money for me i have a long list <laughs> i'll tell you that right now but one of the things i think would be neat to to learn about more to 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 study more is the topic of astronomy learning more about the stars the planets the galaxies out there i remember as a kid i had this book that talked about the different constellations and helped you identify the the patterns of stars in the sky it talked about the different types of stars the different types of planets and things like that and i remember as a kid just thinking it was so neat and going out into the night sky now of course i grew up around here so you had to pick one of those few nights where there are no clouds in the sky <laughs> but on those clear nights going out and trying to find the constellations trying to find the planets um, and so i thought you know if i had a lot of time and money it'd be neat to to buy a, a big telescope and go out on a star on a, on a cloudless night and be able to look up into the heavens uh, it's, it's an interest that i have that i just can't dedicate that much time to and so it's for that reason that this week was was kind of fun for me it was exciting uh, some of you know that there were some new images released by nasa taken by a brand new telescope uh, this is let me see let me turn this on here so last christmas december 25 of 2021 nasa launched this thing up into space and this is called the james webb space telescope and they launched that christmas and since christmas of last year it's been traveling up into its spot where it's going to be orbiting the sun a million miles away from earth and it's been kind of unfolding and getting itself set up ready to take some of the clearest most powerful pictures that have ever been taken of our universe if you've ever seen pictures taken of the hubble telescope this is twice as powerful as hubble and so can see things twice as small twice as far you know amazing technology that gold thing that you see is a giant uh, 21 points uh, 21 point three foot wide mirror plated with gold all so that it can kind of focus the light from the universe in and take these amazing amazing pictures and so since december 25 it's been you know setting up going through its warm-ups and things like that and and just this week nasa released the first few images that the james webb space telescope took now sometimes I've, I've i've talked to people and sometimes people get a little bit uncomfortable with these kinds of things because they think well you're going to talk about the big bang or you know they they feel like it starts to skew a little bit too much towards evolution but the scriptures say psalm 19 verse 1 the heavens declare the glory of god the skies proclaim the work of his hands and for me personally when i see images of space and i learn about these kinds of things it just brings me to a state of awe at the power the majesty of our creator and so to begin with i want to share a little bit of that awe with you we're going to look at some of these pictures i'm sorry if you've already seen these some of you might have seen these floating around this week um, but i thought they're just great and so i wanted to share some of these so this picture was taken of a nebula 
Um, it's, it's near the Carina Nebula. It's actually a, a part of it, uh, kind of separate from it. Uh, the Carina Nebula, just to get a sense of scale here. You can see there's kind of this almost a smoky look at the bottom. It's all red, right? Then you see more of a bluish space above. If you look at the, the peaks in the top of that kind of smoky area, those peaks are about seven light years high. So if you shot a light at the bottom of that peak, it would take seven years for that light to get to the top of that peak. Just amazing, amazing scale, amazing distance here. And what we're seeing is actually a new star that's being born. Um, we can't see it. It's kind of up above and to the right of the image. But as this new star is being created, it's releasing all of this energy, all of this radiation, and it's kind of driving all of the dust and matter and energy away from it. You imagine if you stood in a smoke filled room and then turned on a fan and it kind of like blow the smoke. That's what we're seeing. So we're seeing the smoke, the, the dust and everything being blown away as this new star is being created. Philippians 2, 14 and 15 says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. When I see images like this and I think how they are proclaiming God, proclaiming God's power, God's love of beauty, and the scriptures say that we also can shine like that by our character, by being transformed by the Holy Spirit. We too can shine like stars for Jesus. That's one of the, the, the privileges that we have of being a Christian, that just as the Carina Nebula up here can be this beautiful witness to the amazing power of our Lord, we too can witness to the power of our Savior by the way that we live. So this one, I saw the previous picture was created by a star being born. This is the Southern Ring Nebula, and this spectacle, this display is being created by a star that is dying. It's hard to see because they're very small, but especially if you look at the, you know, like the rightmost picture here, um, if you look this up online or something, there's actually two stars very, very close together that are orbiting around each other. And the, the dimmer of the two stars is dying. And as it dies, it, it releases energy and matter and dust and things like that. And so the different layers of clouds that we see forming a ring around this nebula is actually the tremors as the star starts to go out. And one of the things that I find amazing about this picture is, is the, the vibrant colors. Now, if we were to look at this picture with our naked eye, we wouldn't actually see these colors. Uh, you might know that light can be infrared, ultraviolet, and we can only see the light in the middle. You know, everything that we see, red, yellow, green, blue, purple, all of the colors that we can see is just a small little spectrum in the much wider distribution of where light is. And I wonder sometimes if we can only see this small bit of the spectrum because of sin. I wonder if Adam could have seen more light than we can see today. I wonder, you know, when, when Jesus comes back and we are made new, we receive our new resurrection bodies, if we'll be able to see more of the light spectrum. Colors that we don't even imagine yet, colors that our human eyes can't see right now, what could we see? We know animals, there are certain animals that can see light that we can't see. So maybe one day we'll be able to see stuff like this. They colorize this for us, by the way, so this is all infrared. And so they take the infrared light and they drop it down into the range of color that we can see. And so the colors are there, we just can't see them. They need to manipulate the images to enable us to be able to see these colors, these lights. Um, isn't it amazing to think what we might be able to see without computer manipulation one day when we have that resurrection body? You know, Job 38, 31 through 33 says, uh, God asks Job, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? It's just amazing to think of the power 
of our God. This explosion that's going on in space, we kind of are watching it in slow motion, but it is orders of magnitude bigger than any kind of nuclear bomb or any other kind of uh, power or explosion that we could ever possess. And yet the scriptures say that God is control of that. We can't even imagine the power and majesty of our God. It wasn't only images. Um, the, the telescope, this isn't a picture it took, the telescope was able to take molecular readings from distant planets. And what this graph is showing, I'm sorry, it's very small, but what this graph is showing is that they actually found water in the atmosphere of a distant gas giant, water. People have wondered whether the universe is uninhabited aside from us. And you know, when you read uh, Job 1, it talks about the sons of God coming, and we wonder if that isn't people on other planets. Ellen White talks about other worlds praising God. And so I think it's just really neat that this telescope captured that water does exist elsewhere other than our planet. And so it makes you wonder, yeah, maybe, maybe there are other beings out there worshiping God. Psalm uh, 148, 3 and 4 says, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all you shining stars, praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the sky. Here's a planet completely out of our solar system with waters in its sky. And it just makes me wonder how many other planets out there are praising God. The last one, and this is the one that really was the most stunning to me. And they describe this. This is the one that was looking the farthest. And they say that if you take a little grain of sand, just put it on your finger, and you go out into the night sky and you hold that grain of sand at arm's length, the picture up here is what would be covered up by just that grain of sand. And so they zoomed in that far, that, that close, and every single one of those dots of light that we see is not a star, it's a galaxy. And remember that every galaxy by itself has thousands of stars within it. And one of the neat things about it, if you can look at it up close, um, there's, there's points of light that are not dots or spots, they're actually like lines. And they say that that is because these places are so far away that as they travel, the light is actually bending, being affected by other galaxies, other stars. And so that by the time it gets to us in our telescope, the light looks like it's been bent into almost a line shape because it's so far away. The universe is a vast, vast, magnificent place, and yet God is in control of it. Isn't that amazing? Isn't, doesn't it boggle the mind to think that just a tiny grain of sand's worth of sky contains thousands of galaxies, and multiply that by the entire heavens. God is in control of it all. Psalm 8, 34, and, uh, sorry, Psalm 8, 3 and 4 says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You know, when I see images like this and I think, wow, God really did make all of that. It makes me amazed at how powerful God is, but then it makes me amazingly humble <laughs> because we are just on one little planet circling one little star in one galaxy, in a universe of millions and millions of galaxies. And yet the Bible teaches that God cares for each and every one of us. Now, I've shown you a lot of pictures today. Let's get into the word. I invite you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. We'll begin reading in verse 23. But just as a sense of context here, what's happening, at the beginning of Genesis 18, it tells us about three mysterious visitors that Abraham sees as he's sitting out, and he invites them in, and he, he gives them some food, and we find out that these three mysterious visitors are God and some angels in disguise. Now, right there, that should boggle our minds. The God of the universe who created all of that was walking along past Abraham. And so Abraham invites him in, and he finds out 
that the reason that they're here is to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. And so then what happens? We, we start reading in verse 23. So again, Genesis 18, 23 says, then Abraham approached him, him being the Lord, and said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And then what follows, I won't read it all, but what follows is, is kind of a negotiation. Some of you come from countries where it's common, you go to the marketplace and you negotiate, right? <laughs> the price they tell you is never what you actually end up paying, right? There's a negotiation that takes place. And so Abraham starts to negotiate with God. Well, okay, 50, but what about if you find 45 righteous people? Will you still destroy the Sodom? What about 40? What about 30? And he goes down and down and down. And finally, he says in verse 32, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? God answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. Now we know that unfortunately they didn't even find 10 in Sodom. And so Sodom and Gomorrah do get destroyed after all. And we might say to ourselves, well, maybe it's because God really knew how many people there were. And so he was just humoring Abraham. But when I read this story, it amazes me to think that the God of the universe, the God who can create all of this, is willing to negotiate back and forth with one little man named Abraham. <laughs> you know, God could have just said, what are you talking about? You know I'm God. Let me do what I'm going to do. But he, he's interested in what Abraham has to say. Isn't that amazing? He, he wants to hear Abraham's ideas. He wants to talk to Abraham, and he wants to work with Abraham. It's such an amazing thought to think that our God, the Creator, wants to know what little old John Campbell has to say. Why would he do that? It has to be because of his amazing love. Amen? It's one thing to worship an all-powerful God, and it's one thing to worship a loving God. But the fact that he is both all-powerful and loving at the same time, how lucky are we to serve that kind of a God? Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Now in Exodus chapter 3, God introduces himself to Moses in the burning bush. We know that Moses has been in exile. He has uh, flown. He has, he has run away from Egypt. Uh, the, Egypt. the Israelites are still in slavery. And so God has spoken to Moses out of a burning bush, telling him that he is going to set the Israelites free and that Moses is going to be the one to lead them out. Now, this makes Moses nervous. <laughs> he ran away from Egypt, fearing for his life. And so Exodus 4, verses 1 and 2, Moses says, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that, what is that in your hand? Moses replied, a staff. And then summarizing what follows, God then starts to give Moses some signs. He throws the staff on the ground. God turns it into a snake. Um, Moses puts his hand into his pocket. He brings it out and it's all leprous. It has leprosy, and he puts it back in, and the leprosy goes away. And so God is saying, okay, Moses, I hear you. You're worried that they won't listen to you, that they will ignore you. Here are some signs that I will give you so that they will, in fact, listen to what you have to say. But Moses isn't done. We read in verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to me, to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Verse 11, the Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. 
But Moses said, oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. Have you ever prayed that prayer to God? <laughs> Why me, oh, God? Verse 14 says, the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. Now, again, think about this. The God of the universe, the God that created thousands of galaxies, every single thing that we see when we point our telescope into space, this God is trying to get this one little guy to go along with his plan, and he keeps coming up with excuses. God, they won't listen to me. God, I can't speak. Okay, maybe you'll tell me what to speak, but I still can't do it. And the scripture does say that God gets angry with him in verse 14. The anger of the Lord burned against Moses. But even then, he doesn't snap his fingers and strike him down. He doesn't force Moses to do something. He doesn't lay down the law with Moses. He is still willing to work with this little guy who's afraid. All right, Moses, fine. I'm sending you your brother. He's going to help you. We serve a God who is willing to do that for Moses, who's willing to work with him and willing to help him even though Moses was afraid. And of course, the most amazing example we can think of is the fact that God sent his son to this earth, amen? That the God who created all of this sent Jesus, became flesh, became human. Imagine that, to go from being able to speak and create galaxies to this body of flesh and blood. Jesus did that for us. And more than that, more than just becoming human, he knew that he was going to die a, a painful death. And yet Jesus did that for us, gave it up for us because he loves us that much. And so what do we do? What is our response to all of this? Knowing that God is all powerful, almighty, knowing that he creates galaxies with a word, stars with a thought, and yet he loves us that much. What is our response to that? Well, as I already mentioned, the first response, and I'll come back to it at the end, is just overwhelming praise to our God. Wonder at the majesty and the love for who God is. But also, I think, we, as we remember that God is a creator, we try our best to take care of what he has created. You know, there are other systems of thought out there, evolution, other religions, where it, it teaches that we humans are here because we are the fittest. It's the survival of the fittest mentality. And so because we are here, because we have gained supremacy, we can basically do whatever we want. But our Bible teaches us that God has given us our planet as a gift. And he has put us here to take care of it. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, of course, is we read about creation. God creates the heaven and earth. He creates the animals. He creates humans. And then Genesis 1, verse 28, it says, God blessed them, the humans, and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so you might say, well, there you go. It says rule over it. So that means that we can do whatever we want, right? Well, let's think about this. A good king, a good queen, a good ruler takes care of their subjects, don't they? A bad king might tax relentlessly, might take everything for himself, but a good ruler is going to do everything that they can to help to make their subjects thrive. And so if we have been put in charge of this earth, do we destroy it or do we treat it well? Genesis 2.15, uh, God puts Adam in the Garden of Eden and it says that he put him there to work it and to take care of it. And you might say, well, pastor, that was all before sin. Right? That was the Garden of Eden. That was in a perfect world. We're living in a sinful world. We know it's going to be destroyed. Does it really matter what we do to this creation around us? I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 24, verse 1. Psalm 24, verse 1.
This is a verse I'm sure some of you could probably even say out loud without turning to it. It's a well-known verse. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And this is written before, this is written after sin. This is talking about the sinful world, the world that we inhabit today. That this sinful world is still the Lord's. And so we are the world's stewards. We talk about money and how everything that we earn belongs to God. And so we try to take care of it. We return to God 10% of it as tithe. Time, everything that we have is, all the time that we have belongs to God. And, and we set one day aside to honor him. Well, the world itself also still belongs to God. And so we have been put in as a steward, as a manager of this place that we call home, this planet. And so we should try our best to take care of it. Doesn't mean we worship Mother Earth or anything like that, but we try to treat what God has given us with respect. Picking up some litter, recycling, trying to save some energy or some gas. In today's <laughs> climate where energy and gas are awfully expensive, there's a couple of reasons to try to do that. But we try our best to maintain this planet as a gift from God. So that's one thing we can do. When we, when we acknowledge that God is our creator and that God loves us and that God has given this to us as a gift, we try our best to take care, to take care of this planet. Um, but one other thing, and I want to return to this idea of awe. I find it interesting to read the biographies and the, the recollections of astronauts. Uh, many people who have been up into space talk about almost a spiritual experience that they have, seeing the cosmos, seeing the universe, and marveling at what God has done. Uh, John Glenn was the first American to orbit the Earth uh, back in, I think, 1962 or something like that. And he was able to go back up into space at the age of 77. They gave him the chance to go back up one more time. And when he came back from that journey, uh, this is what John Glenn said. He said, to look out at this kind of creation and not believe in God is to me impossible. It just strengthens my faith. Whether we look up into the sky, whether we see some beauty around us, some plants, some amazing animals, we acknowledge the amazing creative power of our God. Uh, famously, Buzz Aldrin, one of the first men to walk on the moon, he took communion before he did so because he was moved to this amazing sense of awe and of praise of God as he witnessed the majesty of his creation. Uh, there's a man, James Irwin, who was also able to walk on the moon uh, during the Apollo 15 mission. And he said that while he was on the moon, he felt the power of God as I'd never felt it before, as he witnessed that amazing display of all of God's handiwork. Our God is an amazing God. This week, as we prepare to close, my challenge to myself and to you is to look up. And by look up, looking up, what I mean is to not be so bogged down in the everyday life of the world around us to look up and to witness God's creation. We live in a sinful world, unfortunately, and so we know that God's creation has been marred by sin. But even so, let us acknowledge the amazing power and the amazing creativity of our God. The Bible says the stars proclaim the glory of God. My challenge to us this week is that we listen. Let's listen to those stars. Let's hear the amazing praises that we see in the world around us. And let's give thanks to our loving God. I invite you all to stand now as we sing our closing hymn, number 93, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Our Father, when we consider the works of your hand, we cannot help but be amazed. Amazed at your power and amazed at your love. Amazing, amazed that Jesus would come down, give up all of that power, become human, and die for us. And Lord, all we can say is thank you. Thank Amen. you for being such a good God to Amen. us. I pray, Lord, that you would not allow the darkness, the sin of this world to make us downcast. Amen. Open our eyes, Lord. Help us to see all that you have done for us. Amen. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.